시작하겠습니다. Uh, Alice, do you, do you hear me? Um, yep, I can hear you. Okay. Um, I'll make some introductory remark in Korean uh, for a couple of minutes. Then I'll, I'll ask you to speak. Um, Great. Thank you. 세미나 시작을 하겠습니다. 어, 그 오늘 세미나 진행을 맡은 서울대학교 고학수라고 합니다. 어, 그 서울대학교 인공지능 정책 이니셔티브 어, 프로그램의 일환으로 이렇게 웨비나를 진행을 하게 되었고요. 어, 뭐 이제 2000 제격이 2017년 그리고부터 매년 여름에 그 인공지능 정책과 관련된 어, 국제 학술 대회를 진행을 하고 있는 중이고요. 올해는 뭐 모든 분들이 아시다시피 코로나로 인해서 어, 그 물리적으로 모여서 국제 학술 대회를 하는 것은 어려운 상황이라 이렇게 웨비나를 하고 있고요. 지금 여덟 차례 어, 시리즈로 어, 기획을 하고 있는 중에 두 번째입니다. 오늘 어, 발표는 그 엘리스 샹 어, 이제 미국 변호사시고요. 그 어, partnership on AI 어, 라고 하는 그 어, 뭐 글쎄요 이거는 뭐 시민단체 연구 모임 뭐, 뭐 이런 여, 몇 가지 성격이 좀 섞여 있는 어, 조직인데요. 그 미국의 주로 IT 기업들이 펀딩을 해서 어, 이 인공지능 영역과 관련된 여러 가지 사회적, 정책적, 윤리적, 법적 이슈들을 이제 그 연구하는 뭐 그런 조직이 만들어졌습니다. 거기 근무를 하시고요. 아마도 어 이분이 이제 그 파트너십 온 AI에 관해서 약간은 설명을 하실 것 같고요. 이분이 그 중에서 어그 공정성, 투명성, 책임성 뭐 이런 영역을 커버하는 그 팀의 리서치 헤드입니다. 어그 연구자로서의 정체성도 가지고 있는 분이고 논문도 실제로 쓰고 계시고. 어, 오늘 발표도 아마 논문 내용 음, 예, 일부를 말씀을 하실 것 같습니다. 어, 엘리시앙 간략하게 소개 말씀을 드리면 그 지금 말씀드린 대로 파트너십 온 AI에서 일을 하시고 변호사 예일대학교 로스쿨 졸업하신 변호사이신데 뭐 동시에 그 경제학 공부도 하신 분이고요. 그래서 과거 근무 경력으로는 그 어, 로펌 경험도 있지만 동시에 그 어, 연방 중, 준비 위원회 이제 중앙은행이죠 미국에 어, 뭐 그런 데서도 근무를 하고요 어, 민간 기업에서도 또 근무를 하고 그런 다양한 경험이 있습니다. 어, 그래서 알고리즘이라고 하는 게 실제로 어떤 식으로 작동하는지 현장에서 어떻게 작동하는지 이론적으로 또는 법적으로는 어떤 고민을 해야 될 건지 그런 얘기를 하기에 딱그 좋은 적임자이신 것 같습니다. 어, Alice. 어, yeah, now uh, you can start. Hey, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you guys so much for having me today. Uh, my name is Alice Shang, and I'm the head of Fairness, Transparency, and Accountability Research at the Partnership on AI. Next slide. So just by quick way of background about myself, I am a very interdisciplinary researcher with a background in law, statistics, and economics, and I've also previously worked um, as a lawyer, data scientist, and econometrics researcher, and also previously served as a visiting scholar at the Yao Mathematical Science Center at Tsinghua University. So for um, just a little bit of background about the partnership on AI as well, um, so we are a multi-stakeholder organization that was founded by um, first the U.S. Uh, major technology companies, but we are now um, a consortium of over 100 technology companies, um, academic institutions, and nonprofit organizing society, and our mission is to bring together diverse voices um, across various sectors, disciplines, and demographics organizations. And so we conduct research at the intersection of AI so that we can help ensure that developments in AI advance positive outcomes for people and society. And in my work at PAI, I am particularly lead an interdisciplinary team on fairness, transparency, and accountability issues. Um, and that specifically means for us um, issues of algorithmic fairness, explainable machine learning, um, criminal justice risk assessment tools, and also diversity and inclusion in the field of AI.
So first, just to provide an overview of the talk today. So um, today, as I mentioned, I'll be speaking on the intersection of anti-discrimination law and algorithmic fairness, focusing, spe focusing more specifically on US anti-discrimination law since I'm a US lawyer by training. So um, unfortunately, I won't be able to offer insights outside of the US context, but hopefully um, a lot of the conversation that we have today will um, reflect broader um, considerations um, within the legal realm um, beyond just the US context. And um, I'll be focusing on a paper that I have forthcoming called Reconciling Legal and Technical Approaches to Algorithmic Bias. And the key issue that this paper highlights is to what extent can well-meaning algorithm developers use protected class variables to address algorithmic bias in light of existing laws? Um, and also, what is the legal compatibility of the various technical solutions to algorithmic fairness that have been proposed in the machine learning literature? And today's talk, of course, will not be able to cover the full extent of the paper, so I'll focus just on setting the stage. Next slide. So the overall agenda today will be, um, I'll first focus on what is algorithmic bias and provide a few examples just to motivate this question. And then I'll go more into this key tension. So I'll first talk about the need from a technical perspective to use protected class variables in mitigating algorithmic bias. Um, and then I'll go more into the legal side and some of the jurisprudence um, that might conflict when applied to the algorithmic context. And then finally, I'll talk about one potential solution in terms of reconciling these different approaches, um, specifically the potential role of causal inference or the concept of causality um, when it comes to both these legal and technical approaches. And of course, finally, I would like to leave some time at the end for question and answer. Next slide. So first off, why should we care about algorithmic bias? Next slide. So frankly, um, we want to care about algorithmic bias because in an age of AI, increasingly automated decisions affect high stakes areas of our lives. So it matters whether these algorithmic automated decisions um, are done in a fair and just way. Next slide. So in the US, one example that really motivated a lot of the work in this space um, was this investigative report from um, a journalist organization called ProPublica. And what they found was for a algorithmic risk assessment tool used in the criminal justice space in the US that um, the tool had twice as high false positive rates for black Americans as for white Americans. And so this really struck people given that in criminal justice, this is really one of the most high stakes decisions that you can make about a um, human's life. So um, we should be concerned if there's any biases in the tools used there. Um, another prominent example was with Amazon's um, recruiting algorithm. So basically Amazon um, trained a recruiting algorithm based on its historical data of who was hired at Amazon based on a lot of different resumes. And it turned out that historically women got relatively fewer jobs at Amazon than men did. And so the algorithm learned to penalize resumes that had reference to women. So for example, it penalized graduates of women's colleges. Um, so in this case, um, Amazon decided to scrap the algorithm and simply not use it, but it did, did raise a lot of interesting questions in terms of the ways in which um, algorithms can inadvertently um, display some biases and past decision making. And then another example, which is quite different than the previous two, is um, within the realm of representational harm. And what that means is we're not talking about allocating a scarce resource to different people, but instead how one group of people is represented compared to another group. So this problem has since been fixed, um, but basically a while back when you searched in Google um, images for CEO, um, what you would see is basically a lot of images of men, predominantly white men, um, and then the first woman that you would see was actually um, not a real woman, it was CEO Barbie. And so this sparked a lot of debate because people asked, well, what is this teaching? young women and also young men in terms of what it means to be a CEO.
So then um, given those motivating examples, how would we define algorithmic bias? So I provide two um, definitions here, given that um, this is a really um, challenging issue that really encompasses a lot of different um, perspectives. So first, um, algorithmic bias is how algorithmic decision-making processes might systematically lead to worse outcomes for certain subpopulations. And you can also think of this as the disparities that emerge due to demographic characteristics or other factors that are problematic from a societal perspective. Next slide. So then um, given that, why do we care about um, what the law has to say in terms of anti-discrimination law? Why are we talking about reconciling legal and technical approaches? So legal compatibility is important given that if we want to A, demonstrate evidence of bias, it's important that as we come up with different technical definitions for fairness and we come up with different fairness metrics from an empirical perspective, that these metrics conform with what judges, juries, regulators, or others in the legal and policy spaces would accept as evidence of discrimination or lack thereof. And it's also important um, given that if we want to actually take steps to mitigate bias, um, we have to ensure that whatever steps we're doing do not, um, are not considered discriminatory themselves from a legal perspective. So I've talked a bit now about this idea of protected class variables and this key tension between on the one hand, from a technical perspective needing to use them, and another hand, um, the law having some concerns about that. So it's important um, to define then what are protected class variables. And in US law, protected classes are groups that are protected by anti-discrimination laws. And so examples of um, such variables would be race, gender, age, disability, national origin, religion. Um, and it's important to note that this doesn't necessarily cover all variables that we might be concerned about. So you might be concerned if an algorithm were discriminating on the basis of socioeconomic class or geography. Um, but protected class variables are the most important when we're talking about this legal compatibility issue. And it's also important to note um, that when we talk about protected class variables, we're not talking about um, specific groups that have been marginalized. Um, when it comes to race and gender, at least in US anti-discrimination law, they're treated symmetrically. So what that means is um, white men can sue for discrimination on the basis of race or sex, you don't need to be a woman, for example, to sue on the basis of gender discrimination or a racial minority to sue on the basis of um, racial discrimination. So why do we need to use protected class variables in order to mitigate algorithmic bias? Um, why, is, why does this create the tension that we're seeing today? Um, so first off, there's this concept um, in the machine learning community called fairness through unawareness. And what this means is simply removing the protected class variables and close proxies from training data. And close proxies are just variables that are highly correlated with the protected class variable. Um, so for example, um, when it comes to race in the US, geography, um, like um, individual zip codes, um, is quite highly correlated with race because there is quite a bit of geographic segregation across um, different racial groups in the US. And so if you know someone's zip code, that gives you some information about someone's race. So that makes zip code a proxy for race. And the issue with this idea of, well, why don't we just get rid of the race variables, get rid of the gender variables, is that this is actually considered widely naive um, in the machine learning community because there's something called omitted variable bias. Um, and what that means is that if you have enough of these weak proxy variables, you can actually approximate a protected class variable. So if I have um, a lot of variables that um, tell me a little bit of information about race, for example, then if you give me enough of these, I can do a decent job of predicting someone's race without even knowing um, explicitly what their race is. So as a result, simply getting rid of um, the race variable does not necessarily address the issue. 
And um, given how pervasive um, the effects of um, race and gender can be throughout society, um, it can be really easy to collect a lot of these weak proxy variables, um, even if you're not intending to do so. Oftentimes variables like income, like geography, like which school people went to, what professions people are in, give a lot of information about their demographic characteristics. Um, in addition to the fact that getting rid of these um, protected class variables does very little to address bias, there's also the issue that um, these protected class variables are actually very useful when it comes to trying to mitigate um, bias. So it turns out if you actually want to um, actively change your algorithm such that it is less biased in some way, you need to have um, some visibility into the protected class attributes um, of the various individuals that um, are in your data set. And so um, as a result, simply, if you are told that you're not allowed to use these variables, it can make it very difficult to actually mitigate bias in practice. Um, secondly, um, oftentimes, if you know the protected class variable, that can actually provide some helpful context that will not only improve the fairness of your model, but also the accuracy. So one example of this is if you are trying to predict scholastic ability, so maybe you have an algorithm that's part of a school admissions process, and you know that in one culture, the best students all study engineering, and then in another culture, the best students all study law, then knowing which culture a, a given student came from is really helpful when you evaluate um, their scholastic ability. Because just knowing, oh, the student studied engineering or the student studied law doesn't necessarily tell you a lot without also knowing what cultural background they came from. So despite these considerations, so despite the fact that getting rid of these variables um, does not prevent bias and we might need to use these variables um, in order to um, reduce bias, this idea of fairness through unawareness or simply getting rid of the variables is currently the most prevalent approach in the industry. Next slide. So why is that? Why do we see people by and large just addressing algorithmic bias by not making use of these variables? So for one, this is the default if you don't have access to these variables. So oftentimes due to privacy considerations, companies don't necessarily have ready access to um, these sorts of variables or they are very, very careful with how they use the, these variables. In addition, on the surface at least, the um, the nice thing about this approach is it looks like it is blind and to the protected classes. And folks often analogize fairness through unawareness to blindness in anti-discrimination law as a result of this. And then finally, um, at least recently in the um, US, the Department of Housing and Urban Development proposed a rule for disparate impact, which is a type of anti-discrimination law liability that would create a safe harbor for algorithms that do not make use of protected class variables or close proxies. And so what this means is that there's also some evidence that the government response to algorithmic bias might um, actually discourage people from making use of these protected class variables. And the reason this is such a fraught space and the reason why I think this is very interesting even um, just beyond the US context is this really gets to the heart of a core tension within anti-discrimination law um, called anti-classification versus anti-subordination. So anti-classification is the idea that anti-discrimination law should seek to prevent any sort of classification or treatment that differs on the basis of a protected attribute. On the flip side, anti-subordination is the idea that the law should actually seek to actively dismantle existing hierarchies between protected class groups, even if doing so involves some degree of consciousness of these group classifications. And in recent years, the Supreme Court has increasingly adopted anti-classification -class stance, um, but this is something that is really a core tension. And if we continue to see this anti-classification stance, it's possible we will be really um, hamstrung in our ability to actually address algorithmic bias. Next. So now um, that that motivation is complete, let's go into the actual jurisprudence. Next slide.
So in terms of the relevant um, US laws, so I broke this down by public sector and private sector broadly, but um, the laws in both areas do um, have a lot of cross citations and inform each other. So with, for the public sector, the most relevant considerations are the constitution and equal protection doctrine under the 14th amendment. Um, and most relevant within this is affirmative action doctrine, since affirmative action is one of the very few places in US anti-discrimination law where the court has continued to permit some degree of race conscious decision making for remedial purposes. And then on the flip side, for the um, private sector, we have um, anti-discrimination statutes. So most important among these, um, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Um, and within this are disparate treatment and disparate impact doctrines. Um, so I'll walk through very briefly um, these doctrines in the following slides. So first, affirmative action. Um, so um, for those who are less familiar with what affirmative action is, basically affirmative action is the idea of having preferential treatment for groups that have historically faced discrimination. And this, these sorts of policies are usually used in the context of school admissions, employment, or government contracting. Um, this is also known as positive discrimination in the UK and within the US, this has historically applied to racial minorities and women. So what are some of the connections then between affirmative action and algorithmic fairness? Um, first off, a lot of the proposals within the technical community of how you might address algorithmic decision making amount to forms of affirmative action. And so as a result, affirmative action jurisprudence gives us a helpful starting point for starting to evaluate what a legal perspective might be on these different approaches to mitigate algorithmic bias. And then, of course, um, affirmative action is a highly controversial area of law and policy. And so um, understanding some of those controversies and some of the connections between these two areas can be helpful as we think about um, what might happen in the algorithmic space going forward. Um, so I'll run through a couple key um, affirmative action cases. Um, for now. So um, one of the really significant landmark cases within an, um, affirmative action jurisprudence is Regents of University of California v. Baki. Um, this was a case in the 70s where the University of California Davis um, School of Medicine um, had been founded about 10 years prior and had an all-white class. And this is during a time in the U.S. where school desegregation was a major issue. And so there were a lot of conversations about how um, to address these issues of segregation in the US. And so um, the university decided that they would create a program where they would reserve 16 out of the 100 seats in their class for admissions through a special committee. And the goal of this program was to compensate victims of unjust societal discrimination. And the decision in this case really showed how um, split the court was around this. So we had nine justices issue six opinions and the plurality um, opinion was written by Justice Powell and basically concluded that racial quotas such as the 16 out of 100 in this program were impermissible. Instead, the court said it's okay to use race of one of many factors, um, but at the end of the day, your key compelling interest needs to be diversity, not redressing historical discrimination. So you can only use historical discrimination as the motivation for your policy if there is actual evidence of you as a specific school discriminating. And in this case, as I mentioned, the University of California Davis School of Medicine was only around 10 years old when this um, case happened. So, um, so there wasn't really that evidence of historical discrimination that they could point to. Um, so in terms of connections then with algorithmic fairness, this case creates a few challenges when we're talking about mitigating bias in the algorithmic context. Um, for one, it's a, it's a little bit diff, more difficult to conceive of what would diversity mean in the algorithmic discrimination context. And instead, people are usually focused on trying to address historical discrimination. Um, but of course, establishing historical discrimination, if you are, say, a technology company or something like that, that's also a fairly new entity, can create a lot of challenges. Um, in addition, oftentimes the types of techniques that people are using to try to address algorithmic bias 
do look a bit like quotas because they do amount to some degree of rebalancing over um, different demographic groups. So another two cases that are really helpful for our discussion in this space are Gruder v. Bollinger and Gratz v. Bollinger. And these were actually two cases that were decided the same day. One was against the University of Michigan Law School, the other against the University of Michigan undergrad. Um, so Gruder was the law school case, and basically the law school in this context argued that it had a compelling state interest to ensure a critical mass of minorities in order to obtain the educational benefits of diversity. In contrast, the undergraduate institution had a 150 point scale for applicants. So you needed 100 points for admission and minorities gained an additional 20 points. And before I tell you about the decision, it's, I think, um, interesting to note that in the previous slide, we mentioned that the court in um, Baki said that you could have race as one of many factors. And so it's kind of natural that the University of Michigan undergrad thought, well, maybe, maybe a point system then is the way that we can consider race as one of many factors. So it turned out, however, that um, only the law school system was permissible. So the court was not comfortable with the point system that the University of Michigan undergrad had laid out. Um, they concluded that that was too similar to a quota, whereas the law school system, which did not have specific numbers assigned to any of the characteristics, um, was more similar to what the court considered to be using race as one of many factors evaluated on an individualized basis. So how do we reconcile then these rulings with um, algorithms? Particularly the ruling in Graz um, can leave a lot of folks in the algorithmic context scratching their heads given that um, it's hard to think about how exactly do you take into account race within your algorithm in a way that doesn't use any sort of point system, different thresholds, quotas, something that can be very well quantifiable. And indeed, the court itself realized this issue to some extent, at least in, its, in the dissent, um, Justice Souter said um, very cogently that the very nature of the college's permissible practice of awarding value to racial diversity means that race must be considered in a way that increases some applicants' chances for admission. Since college admission is not left entirely to inarticulate intuition, it's hard to see what is inappropriate about assigning some stated value to a relevant characteristic, whether it be reasoning ability, writing style, running speed, or minority race. Justice Powell's plus factors are necessarily assigned some values. And the, the college simply does, um, by a numbered scale, what the law school accomplishes in its holistic review, a distinction that does not imply that applicants to the undergraduate college are denied individualized consideration or a fair chance to compete on the basis of all of the various merits their applications may disclose. So even at the time that this decision was made, it was already clear, at least among some of the justices, that this was going to create some degree of conflict. Um, so given that um, those cases in the affirmative action space, which sort of show us that there might be some challenges when we try to apply that jurisprudence in the algorithmic context, let's also look for a second outside of the affirmative action context. So I'm going to quickly just introduce the concepts of disparate treatment and disparate impact, which um, govern um, are the most relevant doctrines um, under Title VII and are very relevant, especially for private sector entities. So disparate treatment um, refers to more classical discrimination, usually intentional discrimination, requiring some sort of proof of racism, sexism, so on and so forth. So for example, if it's an employment discrimination case in the human context, no algorithms involved, um, you might want to show that your boss has made some derogatory remarks about minorities in the past. In contrast, disparate treatment um, is a situation where we're worried about the fact that facially neutral policies might still have unjustifiably disproportionate effects. So intentionality is not a key consideration here. Instead, we have a burden shifting framework where the plaintiff first needs to show disproportionate outcomes by group, and then the defendant um, has the ability to show some sort of business necessity. And so, for example, if you are a fire department and as part of your qualifications, you require people to lift a certain amount of heavy weight, um, 
if you were being sued on the basis of gender discrimination for that policy, you would need to show that there's, you actually need to be able to lift that amount of weight in order to do the job of a firefighter. It's not simply um, an arbitrary block um, preventing women from getting the job. Finally, um, if the defendant is able to do that, the plaintiff needs to show that there's a less discriminatory option that achieves the same business objectives. And so in this way, we're really trying to get at this idea of there is this disproportionate effect that cannot be explained after we go through all of these legitimate considerations. Next slide. And so one of the key cases um, in this area is Texas versus inclusive communities. And this established disparate impact doctrine in the housing context, but most importantly for our discussion today, it also um, stated that a plaintiff's prima facie case must draw a causal connection between policy and practice and the statistical um, disparity. And it's interesting that um, the HUD rule that I, I mentioned earlier, the Department of Housing and Urban Development's rule that created a safe harbor from disparate impact liability for algorithms that do not make use of protected class variables or close proxies was actually um, based on this case. So that was um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development's attempt to instantiate the decision of this case into um, a specific rule. But interestingly, um, the department's rule really has nothing to do with causality. Um, having the presence of protected class variables or the absence of them really does not tell you anything about causality. Next slide. So why do we care about causality? How is that entering this discussion? So first off, causality is important because from a legal perspective, um, discrimination is generally defined as making a decision because of X, where X is the protected class variable. And so as a result, when we undergo any sort of legal analysis around anti-discrimination liability, we naturally have questions around causality. And so what this means is that judges will ultimately be evaluating causal relationships. So for example, would your model have made the same decision, but for an individual's race, gender, so on and so forth. And there are certain benefits to causal approaches that can help us address some of the challenges um, we discussed earlier in, um, the, in terms of how jurisprudence might not align well in the algorithmic context. So first off, um, causal approaches can allow for distinctions between different types of uses of protected class variables. So for example, are you trying to actually mitigate bias or are you trying to make your algorithm more biased? Um, more specifically than that, are you increasing or decreasing the causal relationship between the protected class variable and your um, algorithm's predictions or decisions? And this is important because um, what we're having right now is a tendency to simply throw out protected class variables due to the concerns that they, the presence of them might create legal liability when what we really need to do is distinguish between good and bad uses of these sorts of variables. Uh, so in addition, um, as I mentioned earlier, protected class variables can create, um, can provide important contextual information as well. And so distinguishing between causation and correlation is thus important because not all correlations with protected class variables are necessarily harmful. So overall takeaways from today's talk, first off, legal compatibility is really key to employing algorithmic bias mitigation techniques in practice. But there is a tension between the need to consider um, protected class variables in order to mitigate bias um, on the one hand, but on the other hand, the law's preference for decision-making that's blind or neutral to these attributes, and specifically as we saw in the um, affirmative action context, the preference for, um, for approaches that do not quantify in any way the amount of preference given to different groups. So um, the next takeaway is that causality is a key concept in both machine learning and law that can help us distinguish between different uses of protected class variables and can hopefully 
thus prevent the proliferation of biased algorithms while permitting the use of um, bias mitigation techniques. So that's um, the end of my presentation and I welcome any um, questions that folks have at this time. And as I mentioned at the top as well, um, these topics are discussed in much greater depth um, in my forthcoming law review article, um, which you can also find currently on SSRN. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 질문 그 채팅창에 올려주시면 되고요. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Um, there's one question on uh, the chatting room. There's another. Do you, do you do you see it or I I'll read the first one. You can address the first question. Okay, great. Sounds and, good. Um, so the first question is about uh, what kind of uh, data or input data uh, should be used or should not be used. So I'll read the question. Um, is differential treatment based on omitted variables, for example, zip code, legally equivalent to discrimination based on protected class variable? Um, is it legally pro problematic or ethically problematic? Yeah, great question. Um, so I would say on the legally problematic end, um, it depends a little bit on the court itself and whether they see through that use of the variable like zip code. Um, so it, um, if it's say a disparate treatment um, claim, then there would be some question of motivation within that. Um, and disparate impact, um, there. Um, given the high correlation there, if a court could potentially ask um, whether essentially this is also creating some disparate effects um, along racial lines. Um, I think at this point, most people in the U.S. do kind of realize to some extent, or I guess most legal scholars at least in the U.S. do realize that zip code and race are fairly highly correlated. So in that sense, um, that's an example where the court would probably be able to see through that. Um, but that said, there's also the consideration in terms of some of the privacy concerns that people have around these variables, and that's a little bit distinct from the anti-discrimination concerns. So, for example, one thing we've seen um, in our research is that a lot of um, companies do, if they aren't able to gain access to data specifically about race, for example, they might use some data about geography or zip code instead. Um, and they consider that to be a little bit safer because there's not really the same privacy protections there. Um, so kind of putting this aside the anti-discrimination concerns, that's something that is um, at least perceived to be potentially less legally problematic. Um, but to your question about ethically problematic. Um, so one of my concerns in this space is that I think um, the focus on protected class variables and making those um, extremely salient um, in the algorithmic context does risk us um, being too, um, too okay with people simply using weak proxies, which can be as detrimental in the algorithmic context as strong proxies, but aren't necessarily seen as being as problematic. And so if we're kind of taking the law aside for a moment and just thinking about the ethics or the actual consequences of a certain algorithmic decision-making process, we should be um, as concerned about cases where we have a lot of weak proxies as when we have um, strong proxies or the variable itself. Okay, um, I see a few questions lined up. <laughs> Um, I think that's a good sign. Uh, the next question uh, is about uh, building a model and what kind of data to be used or not to be used. So uh, the question is, with testing the model without uh, the racial variables versus with the search variable to see which result is uh, less biased uh, one way or the other. Um, and doing so, uh, would that be helpful uh, to figure out the usefulness of including, for example, a racial variable in the first place? Yeah, great question. So 
Um, so yeah, I, I, that is something that is useful to test out. Um, but I'll also say that um, oftentimes the usefulness of including protected class variables is not necessarily just in including them directly in the model, but instead um, in including them as part of some sort of bias mitigation technique that is a little bit distinct from just including them in the model. So for example, um, in the in the example I gave around the different cultures, you know, you might want to have a variable that is basically an interaction term between um, between the national origin of this person and what their major in college is. And so that way you allow the model to learn that, oh, if this individual is from culture A and um, study engineering, that's, you know, really great. Um, and if this um, individuals from a different culture and studied law, that's also really great, and those are equally great. Um, so in that example, you're not necessarily putting um, national origin just directly as one of the features, but more as an interactive term. So um, you do need to be careful about how you use the protected class variables in your model, um, and that you're doing so in a way that is not just amplifying um, the biases, but rather is actually trying to actively reverse them. Okay. Um, from the same uh, person who asked this question, there is a, a comment plus additional question. Uh, so I read, we try to avoid using the racial variable for admission. Uh, instead, uh, use geographic variable, income variable, etc. Uh, but actually resulted in less discrimination across geographic areas, uh, but did not solve the under admission of certain races. Therefore, sometimes the use of uh, racial variable uh, may be necessary for affirmative action, uh, or if we want to similar representation of a given race in a student body. Uh, would this be likely be illegal? So I, I should clarify that. Um, so the reason affirmative action is such an interesting area of jurisprudence is that is one of the few places where it's actually not illegal to um, to consciously take into consideration race. And so at least for now, um, if you were a school in the United States and you were consciously taking into consideration race rather than geography, um, that would be fine. I mean, you, you know, there's a lot of um, cases right now, like Harvard is um, being sued uh, among a lot of other schools um, around their affirmative action policies. So it's possible the jurisprudence might change in the near future. Um, but at present, um, considering race um, when putting together a student body is not illegal. Um, but I think the um, sort of the comment that you provided is also really interesting in that this is also something that's more generally been found where one of the problems with people um, just being very scared of using race as a variable instead using um, geography or other proxies is that um, you don't necessarily accomplish the same sorts of effects in terms of trying to address the historical discrimination or the disparities that you're seeing. And in some cases, you can actually exacerbate that. So um, you can think of this as like, if you were um, trying to do some rebalancing across two different school districts, one is predominantly white, one is predominantly black. Um, and if there's someone who is black living in the predominantly white school district and all you are considering is geography, you might actually make it really hard for this uh, black individual living in a white district because you're not looking at race, which is what you actually care about, you're looking at geography. Um, so there's definitely some downsides to using geography instead of race, even though kind of on its surface that might seem um, a little bit more palatable. Okay, um, so next question is about a practical aspect. Um, how do you examine or audit an, an algorithm? It's, um, you know, a typical, atypical uh, response would be, this is trade secret, you, you, you know, I cannot re give you uh, the details of the algorithm. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Um, it's, 
it's a challenge and um, it's something where uh, a lot of agencies are still trying to figure this out in terms of what kind of um, disclosures should they require from companies and what kind of access would they need. Um, I, I think one thing that is helpful in the space is you really, um, you don't necessarily need to have access to the source code and the data itself, which is um, what would be protected by trade secret in order to get some sense of how the algorithm is performing for different demographic groups. Um, so there's still a lot of controversy when it comes to what types of metrics people should actually be using. Um, but I think if we get to the point of algorithmic audits, um, you know, it'll probably be an iterative process. You start with certain metrics that you require the companies themselves to um, provide for you. And then um, as we learn more, maybe those metrics will change. But um, there's that kind of information. And there's also information that's relevant in terms of how the algorithm um, was designed, what sorts of internal checks the companies conducted. So there are types of disclosures that might not require um, IP from being disclosed. Okay. Um, there, are, there, are, there are a good number of questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> the next question is um, um, this, um, you know, studying algorithmic fairness and discrimination, um, would that give us more opportunities to find out what kind of biases are out there in the society, which perhaps we uh, didn't know uh, previously. Uh, and also, if we study algorithmic fairness, um, would that also include finding out biases in the data set itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, um, yeah, I think one of the really exciting things, um, so I think often in this space, it's kind of um, very scary at all, you know, like, oh, these algorithms are, you know, have all these biases. But I think one of the really exciting things about the space is um, there's a lot of biases um, in any sort of decision making, human or algorithmic. And one of the potential advantages or one of the great things that might emerge in the algorithmic context is if we take algorithmic bias really seriously and really um, work hard to detect it, study it, mitigate it, then that means we could potentially make a much fairer society um, in that there's some um, advantages to being able to directly interrogate the data, which can sometimes be harder when it comes to directly interrogating humans, um, which is often less, um, less pragmatic. And so um, in that sense, I think um, studying algorithmic bias can really teach us a lot potentially about how um, humans have been making decisions in the past, how different um, inequities um, propagate throughout society. And hopefully, um, if we are able to take um, active steps in this area, we can also mitigate some of these biases. Okay. Um, um... Another question is about uh, the general trust uh, on AI uh, algorithmic decision making. Um, in the US and uh, EU as well, uh, they talk a lot about uh, you know, algorithmic fairness and, and that kind of based on the suspicion that there may well be occasions where we really cannot believe in um, algorithmic decision-making process. Um, but the question here is, uh, interestingly, many Koreans believe that AI is actually better and fairer than human decision-making. Um, for example, a AI is not sub subject to corruption, not influenced by personal relationship, etc. cetera. So, so that respect supposedly in a society with less trust in human uh, decision making, uh, while well, arguably in many developing countries uh, as well, uh, AI could possibly serve as a solution, uh, giving a fairer uh, decision and making a fairer society. Um, so I'd like to hear uh, your view on that kind of observation. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so 
I would say that um, I guess there's there's a few aspects um, to that. So, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm just trying to see. Um, is this one of the? Um, sorry, actually, uh, is the third from the left. Interestingly, many Koreans. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, sorry, yeah. So I think it depends on what kind of fairness you're talking about. Um, first off, because um, I think when when you mentioned the corruption and personal relationships aspects, that kind of gets a little bit more to procedural fairness questions, which we didn't talk to, uh, we didn't talk about today, but still are very very salient in the algorithmic context. So, for example, let's say you know we're doing school admissions again, there's like these different scores and such, you, you still will need to have some human at the end of the day make um, designing the algorithm and then using the algorithmic results. So in that sense, you still might have some of these concerns around corruption or personal relationships if, um, if, um, if you don't necessarily have the best um, procedural fairness um, steps put in place as well. Um, and then there's also the issue of um, people often think about algorithms as being very objective because they are trained on data, but it's important to interrogate what kind of data they're trained on. And the reality is that most data reflect the decisions of humans. So for example, um, when it comes to at the admissions example, again, if we were to train an algorithm to do school admissions, we'd essentially give them a training data set that is a lot of historical school decisions. So we'll have, you know, maybe someone's like test scores, GPA, um, you know, what kind of classes they took, uh, maybe some demographic attributes, um, and then whether they got admitted or not admitted in the past. And so, um, so if we train an algorithm like that, then any sort of biases that were reflected in how in the past people were admitted into schools would still be reflected to some extent in this new algorithm. So in that sense, there's um, still these same human biases that end up getting um, to be a concern even when we're talking about the algorithmic decision-making context. Um, and then I think the last point I would just make on that is um, there, it's an open question, especially when we talk about algorithmic audits, what the proper benchmark is for algorithmic decision making. So some people argue the benchmark should just be what um, humans are able to do and how biased humans are. And so as long as it's better than a human, then that's good. Um, other people would say that um, what's unique in the algorithmic context um, is that you have such centralization of decision making and you also have more ability to craft this decision making process to be what you want. So in that sense, maybe we should hold it to a higher standard because you can actually very empirically measure things like the disparities that it causes. Um, or you can really directly try to examine different counterfactual scenarios with this. So in that case, maybe we should hold this to a higher standard because we have some more control over it. Okay, um, one related question. Um, your talk today was basically based on the US jurisprudence, but I. Uh, uh, I know you spent quite some time in China and taught a course at Tsinghua University. And I wonder what kind of uh, different or similar reactions there were uh, among the Chinese audience uh, about the general uh, concept and, and, and jurisprudence and, and maybe a, a policy perspective related to uh, AI uh, 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 fairness. Conception. Yeah, so um, so I guess when I was teaching in China, it was to kind of a diverse um, set of students, mostly um, mostly STEM students, and then some policy students. So so no law students. <laughs> um, so in that sense, the the jurisprudential aspect was interesting, but maybe not the main focus for them. Um, I would say that the, over, um, the overall reaction that I got was, um, it's, it's interesting to see how um, in the US, um, algorithmic fairness has really become like one of the major concerns when it comes to people talking about 
algorithmic governance um, because we've had all these examples, especially in the criminal justice system um, with these risk assessment tools and facial recognition technologies. Um, it's really anytime people talk about law or policy around algorithms, they bring up the issue of bias as a fundamental motivating harm. Um, it was interesting to me um, teaching in China how for the students there that wasn't necessarily something that resonated as much with them. Um, they definitely had more so the perception that algorithms are pretty neutral, um, objective, they're just kind of based on math and data. So um, in that sense, they should just be um, kind of universally better than human decision makers. Um, so I think that was kind of a, a interesting difference. And um, I think, you know, over the course of the class, they kind of, you know, maybe changed their perception a little bit um, about that. Um, but I think it does show also the, the influence of having a few very salient high profile examples, which we've had many of those at this point in the US that have gotten people really um, concerned about discrimination um, in the algorithmic context and outside of the algorithmic context, um, but maybe that's been less so um, in some other countries. Okay, uh, another related question. Um, you just said you, you taught a, a group of STEM students. So I assume you sometimes work with engineers and sometimes work with lawyers. Um, and my observation is engineers tend to focus on say uh, substance or uh, try to find measurable metric and and from there they try to get an optimum uh, so they they don't care too much about the process in general uh, but more about the getting the the best or optimal result uh, and the, uh, in contrast lawyers tend to focus on uh, the process or due process or the procedural aspect so how do you reconcile? Um, and there, there is a, a question uh, on the chatting uh, room, uh, which is asking, do you have any suggestions on how lawyers can work or coordinate with tech people to achieve legal compatibility, the design, deployment, and use uh, stages? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so I would say that um, part of why I think this question of causal inference is so interesting when we're talking about reconciling the legal and technical components is that causal inference is one area where for the STEM community, there's also a very strong need to interrogate more so, not just the results, but the actual mechanisms themselves. Um, because the moment you're talking about causality, you're really talking about science in a way that is about how does something happen and not just what are the results of the process. Um, and so in that sense, I think it can be helpful in opening up some of these questions because if you see a certain disparity and you are required from a legal perspective to say what is the cause of that disparity because we need as lawyers to be able to diagnose is this a disparity that you have any grounds to fix or do you have any legal responsibility for this any legal liability for this um, we are forced to basically ask those sorts of questions. And um, that's something that can be understood within the STEM space as well as an area where people need to not only just consider, oh, how well did my algorithm perform, but also look back more carefully in terms of what are the underlying data generating mechanisms within this data, where might potential biases enter that and how do I then quantify that and address that? So I think it can be a good forcing mechanism to encourage folks to actually think about the most relevant questions in this space, which are really diagnosing the historical discrimination that you are trying to address and then crafting a solution that's narrowly tailored to that specific issue. Okay. Um there, there are more questions, but I think um, we covered uh, more than enough. So, uh, <laughs> Thank you all for the questions. Yeah, they yeah, were all yeah, very yeah. insightful and interesting. Yeah. Um, so um, um, I'll make very short uh, uh, concluding remark in Korean. Uh, um, so, 질문들이 몇개 더 있는데요. 뭐 이미 Q&A 뭐 되게 텐스하게 한거 같아 가지고 어 이제 몇개 남은 질문은 다음 기회로 미뤄야 될것 같습니다. 음 
Alice, I assume you're in California. Um, so it's evening time, and 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 we uh, all appreciate your sparing time uh, oh, during course. this difficult period. Uh, and I think we learned a lot, um, and and uh, it was a great opportunity. So uh, thank you for uh, the excellent presentation, and also uh, good uh, 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 answer for the questions. Uh, well, thank you. We'll thank finish you so much for uh, having me. the webinar here. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.